And how many of you have dogs? How many of you have cats? How about birds or small mammals? And then how many of you live with other people in the household? Now, how many of you have dogs, cats, birds, or other people in the household who engage in behaviors that bother you? <laughs> OK, so that's perfect, because this is exactly where you want to be. Because the principles we're covering today are principles that guide learning in all animals. And realistically, if we understand these principles, just these basics that I'm going to cover in this lecture, then we can handle 90% of what we want to change in animals. And we can do that all using the same approach. So I, theoretically, today, you'll be able to go home and change behavior in your dog and cat, as well as your housemate or roommate, as long as they don't know that that's what you're doing. <laughs> now, there are often more subtle signs of fear and anxiety. So the obvious sign would be cowering, or the animal runs away, or it hides. But they can also just move away for a step or look away, and people often miss that. They may pant when they're not hot. And it's especially panting with the commissures of the mouth back. They may lick their lips when food is not on its way. They may salivate, urinate, or defecate. They can be hypervigilant, which means they're glancing in, in many different directions for short periods of time. It would be like how, what you would do if you're walking late at night and you heard there was an axe murderer around. You'd be looking around. They may yawn. And a big thing is they often will look tired or move in slow motion. So some dogs actually start moving faster. They start jumping or pacing. And other dogs start moving in slow motion, so they shut down. And they can have a tense look on their face because their brow is furrowed. And often they'll stop eating. So they were eating, or they may have been eating, and then they suddenly stop. So we'll often use that as a measure of how comfortable are they right now. OK, low stress handling of difficult dogs and cats in the hospital and shelter setting. The facts for people who work with animals is that 90% of hospital injuries are due to dog and cat bites. And for hospitals in the US, that brings us to about $1,500 per worker's compensation claim. And we also know that at vet hospitals, that fewer and fewer people are bringing their animals in because they feel that their animals are stressed. So a lot of people are choosing to not bring their pets in because their animals are stressed, especially cats, but still a high proportion of dogs. What I'm going to go over in this lecture is additional solutions besides greeting correctly and recognizing fear. So I'm going to go over additional solutions that require more thought at first, but do not require more time. So these are additional solutions that, cause, additional solutions that require more thought at first, but not additional time. So these are several general principles of handling, and each can make the difference between whether the animal's patient, uh, whether the patient is fractious or cooperative. So seven principles, and each will make the difference between whether the patient is fractious or cooperative and friendly. So basically, you want to think, what are all the things my dog wants? And then you're going to use those things to your advantage. So we're not just using food. We're using everything the dog wants to our advantage. Now, why do I have dogs say please by automatically sitting for everything they want? Why did I choose that versus a trick? Because the goal of this is to train the dog to look to the owner for guidance. How can they pay attention to you if they're not actually looking to you? If they're not actually paying attention to you, how can they pay attention to you? So we want to train the dog to look to you for guidance. Um, OK, so you guys saw the difference in her gait, though, when we went to a trot. But she can't handle a trot for very long, just because actually for her, she doesn't need to walk that, that faster speed, because she's just she's a good dog already. She comes with you. But just so that you could see that when you, when you started walking faster, even at 125, like I was trying to have you hit 135, and you were probably like at 130. Okay. And so she wasn't really, she was staying in her little ambling gait. Uh -huh. But I think part of that was because she's also tired. She doesn't have a lot of energy, so it was hard to get her up to that speed. But at the 135, when she was up there, she was trotting. She had a little nice springy gait. And even at 130, she was starting, she was looking up at you pretty well. Okay. 
So the difference between like a one, for her, like a, a 117 and a 125 is that at 117 she just walks with her head down and at 125 she looks up at you. Yeah, yeah, were you able to see that difference in her? Let's walk her around a little bit more and just see how she is when she's walking. And let me just have you do a slower pace at first and see if you see a difference. So here, that's the slower pace. And this would be the pace where she might look around. Now just speed up and we'll just have you do it once and see what she does. There. And she looks ahead, we'll just do one turn. Yeah, speed up just a little bit, there. And you can go there. Okay. So our overall approach is going to be, number one, keep the dog safe. That means out of situations where he might bite or be aggressive, unless you're specifically working on those situations. So number one, keep the dog safe out of those situations. Number two, identify all the situations where he's fearful and keep him out of those situations, unless you're desensitizing him at that instant. So keep him all, out of all the fear situations. Number three, find all the high arousal situations and keep him out of those, unless you're addressing those situations. In the meantime, he's going to need to be on the Learn to Earn program to work on impulse control. And then four, then once we have considered all of these three things and we're especially keeping him safe, then we're really going to focus on let's desensitize and counter condition him to all of those specific fears or reactivity situations. And once we get that going, we get all these things going, then if we want, we can address any other of the handling or aggression situ situations later.